Hi, I'm Bob Kakamo and this is Chandler in Focus. Welcome. Today we're going to be talking about a, a health topic that should be of interest to everybody. It concerns uh, health issues of the urinary tract. And with me today is Dr. Matthew Karlovsky. Welcome, doctor. Thanks for having me, Bob. Well, tell me something as, before we get into the topic. Why would a doctor specialize in something like urinary or urology when it seems like all the doctors are going Hollywood and doing plastic surgery and doing all of these glamorous specialties? What would make somebody specialize in this particular field? That's an interesting question that actually a lot of patients ask me because the urinary tract has to do with a lot of the private parts um, that for some people they may be embarrassed to speak about, but for that very reason, it's not a very common medical specialty for doctors to go into. So in medical school, I became interested in this for that very reason because it wasn't much talked about during lecture. And so I pursued it further and I found it very interesting. And the urinary tract involves both the kidneys, the bladder, and the urethra, both in men and women, but it also has to do with the reproductive organs in men uh, as well. And so there are a lot of topics which perhaps 15, 20 years ago were still in the closet, but these days patients and physicians are more comfortable to speak about these topics openly, and uh, some of them deal with quality of life issues such as urinary incontinence or um, enlarged prostate, erectile dysfunction, etc., but some of them are more serious in terms of cancers of the urinary tract, whether it's kidney, bladder, etc. Wow, you just opened up a whole plethora of things we could be talking about here. But before we do that, what do you have to do to become a specialist? I mean, you go to med school, and then what happens from there to become a doctor? Well, to prepare for entrance to medical school, you have to do a series of uh, requirements in college, mainly pre-med courses, sciences, and then an acceptance into medical school with uh, an exam called the MCAT, which is similar to the SAT to get into college. Once in medical school, there are several years of basic uh, learning uh, in a classroom environment. And then when the clinical rotations, um, excuse me, are taken in your second, and, uh, third, and fourth year, that's when someone can choose what they want to do. So they go and do the rotations, whether it's surgery, medicine, pediatrics, etc. And urology, tickled my fancy when I saw that not many people discussed it. Everybody was focused either on primary care, radiology, et cetera, other topics. Once someone is decided upon what they want to choose and they apply to a residency program after four years of medical school. Residency program for urology is usually six years, some of them are five, and that's six years of surgical and other types of training within the specialty, whether it's research, um, and it depends on uh, where you go, really, around the country. It's a nationwide match to see which program you're accepted to. Even then, after residency, if you wish to subspecialize, even within urology, for example, which is what I chose to do, then you can, sign to, uh, can decide to do a fellowship in a specific subtopic, such as cancer, urinary tract dysfunction, which was my subspecialty, infertility, for example, is another one. So there are a host of different topics that open up the further along you get in your training. Okay. To me, it sounds like if you go through all the training, by the time you finish your training, you're ready to retire and collect Social Security. <laughs> There's so much studying to do. But you, you, you touched on one topic that's becoming more and more, uh, oh, it's covered more and more that you see it in the papers, in the medical uh, columns in the paper, uh, female urinary incontinence. What is that all about? Can you explain that? That's it's one of your areas, correct? Right. My fellowship training is in pelvic floor dysfunction, both male and female. And one of the topics is incontinence that happens with women basically in early middle age and later on. It, incontinence basically is involuntary loss of urine during whether you're doing activities such as running, jumping, coughing, exercise, sneezing, anything of that nature. It can also occur um, without uh, knowledge, let's say you have uh, overactive bladder type symptoms or you feel that you have to go to the bathroom and you just can't get there in time. A lot of these sound uh, somewhat silly, but actually they can be a big imposition on someone's quality of life. Sometimes these occur just with the aging process after childbirth, for example, and simple exercises can help alleviate those symptoms, but uh, there are times when they become uh, more of a problem 
due to uh, wetting and embarrassment, smell, and people start to restrict their social activities and leave, even uh, decide not to leave the house because they're embarrassed. Then it becomes more of a significant problem and at that time patients do seek out medical uh, expertise. So there's a wide uh, array of um, patient uh, uh, issues that can lead to this, uh, some of which I just mentioned such as just childbirth, sometimes after hysterectomy or even certain medications which patients may take for high blood pressure can lead to incontinence and some of them are reversible and treatable other times it's just knowing how to manage fluid. If someone is drinking six cups of coffee a morning, well, that's going to send some to someone to the bathroom. But if someone can reasonably manage themselves throughout the day, then they can avoid a lot of urinary incontinence problems. Now, because of the articles in the paper, are we seeing more and more of this? Is it becoming a bigger problem? And if so, what are the risk factors? Uh, you know, you said pregnancy or childbirth. Uh, Basically, we're seeing more of it mainly because both men and women are living longer and so they stay more active into their later years and as such if someone wants to for example play tennis, golf, whatever it may be and this thing gets in the way this is something that they want to address whereas maybe 30-40 years ago this was more of an embarrassment issue and no one would talk about it and so it would restrict them uh, restrict themselves and they would stay at home mainly and not bring it up so uh, people are more inclined to discuss this these days, but also the growing older healthy population of women will, uh, is leading to a more of an incidence of this topic, of uh, the subject. Now, the uh, usual risk factors, some of which I mentioned were uh, essentially childbirth and sometimes hysterectomy. Just the aging process alone, menopause usually leads to uh, these symptoms. Not all the time they're significant enough to warrant medical treatment, oftentimes uh, some behavior modification and uh, Kegel muscle exercise or pelvic floor rehab can help modify and improve the symptoms. However, uh, some women will notice that uh, with repetitive exercise, sometimes with aerobics, just the simple act of bouncing can lead uh, is a risk factor uh, because of the strain on the pelvis. Other people notice chronic cough, smoking, those types of issues also put a strain on the pelvis and can potentiate this problem. So you're saying one of the treatments is therapy. Are there other treatments for incontinence? There are a lot of treatments. Or procedures? Some of them. Um, first is to determine if you have reversible incontinence. That could be either from drinking too much. In Arizona we're used to drinking a lot of water because it's always warm. However, if someone is drinking more than about two liters a day or two quarts a day, that can be excessive. Uh, and so that can uh, worsen anybody's uh, bladder function. Urinary tract infection is a common cause of incontinence easily treated by antibiotics. Sometimes diuretics for blood pressure can lead to urinary incontinence. These are all reversible. If someone has, for example, undiagnosed diabetes, that can lead to urinary incontinence. So there are a lot of underlying health issues, not the bladder's fault that can be treated to alleviate urinary incontinence. Often pelvic floor rehab, mus uh, Kegel muscle exercises that women are often taught um, during Lamaze class can help to strengthen the pelvic floor and the bladder sphincter and that helps to lessen the degree of urinary incontinence as well as managing fluids which I mentioned earlier. Um, if it gets to the point where it's significant beyond that then there are medications to help with overactive bladder type symptoms and there are available minimally invasive treatments for stress incontinence as long as that's appropriate and the patients want to have a permanent fix.